The second thing I want to say, and I'll come back to that, is um, that it'll implicate us all in a complicated way. And this is a diagram I do a lot, but I want to kind of push a wee bit of it here, which is that essentially the, um, the violence, the, the 1920-21 settlement, which created Northern Ireland, uh, was created in the context of this great British-Irish um, relationship. Uh, and it was a, a wider imperial discussion. It was a whole global discussion. What happened in Northern Ireland in many ways is this island escaped its enemy, this island escaped its enemy, and these people ended up with an intensive version of the same thing. <laughs> that history is the present in here, history is the past in here, because the, <laughs> because the, the daily experience of what it was to feel that you were at the end of some threat or violence disappeared in 1920 and 21 on these islands in the here, but it remained absolutely intact and in fact it actually intensified for the people inside here because both of them felt abandoned. Actually, underlyingly, they both feel abandoned to, to each other. Effectively, if you understand history, and my understanding of history now takes me to say this was, and I don't even think it was deliberate, but it was a convenient uh, invention which allowed History to, the, 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 the history to be taken away from the rest of Britain and the rest of Ireland. <laughs> uh, and of course, the Northern Irish, especially the Unionists, accepted it, so they thought that made them tighter into Britain, but in fact, I'm not sure it does. But the, <laughs> the, uh, the truth of the matter is, we now have a different experience in this little zone of six counties than outside it, largely because it, it does bleed out a bit. <laughs> bleeds out a bit because of the intensity of that experience and the upfrontness of that experience. Secondly, it, whereas in the South, because the, the defeat of the Unionists was total in the South, it was, it was simply, that was them gone in a sense. Uh, the the post-1921 um, uh, state it's essentially the state for, of everybody, it's the state of the revolution against the British and everybody at some level or other either buys into that or just has to kind of find their way with it. But that is the state. There is a citizenship which emerges in which all of the people can look at the state as their binding point of social cohesion. That is what we have together, is we are in this country as members of it and it is something which we share. Okay, so the state can at least for, although a bit halfy, halfy for some people with border relatives and so on, but nevertheless the state itself actually is quite cohesive, very cohesive. But in the north, you have a very, very almost the opposite situation. Instead of cohesion, you have cohesion on the, on the paper, Northern Ireland is all very nice and it's a beautiful country. Uh, that's the constitution, that's the Government of Ireland Act, but what you have in practice, in relational terms, is this. You have one group of people who describe themselves as unionist and are tied to Protestantism and, and its history in Ireland, for whom uh, this is exactly the same. This is the state, this is our state, you should, this is our point of social cohesion, we all belong here and so on. It's distanced already from the UK, so it's in the UK. But inside the, their opponents, and you're dragged into this because of history, because you may not even feel it, but because you're a Catholic, you're pulled into it, and because you're a Protestant, you're pulled into it, because of, you know, I didn't know they were a Jew until they came to get me, kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> you're treated as one even if you don't want to identify with this stuff. Uh, that's actually the truth of the matter, is you have a, a large portion of the population, in some places the majority, and, way, and over a third of it the, all, at all times, saying, this is not liberation. This is a continuation of exclusion. This is a continuation of tyranny, as far as we're concerned. And so instead of this is a point of social cohesion, this is the point of maximum social discord, <laughs> the state. Does, does that make sense? And the state is what does education, and the state is what does authority. And so how the state is telling you to do these things is differently received here and here, every time, and it runs in a loop. Furthermore, if your school structure reflects that, <laughs> that, 
that is almost inevitably a deep, it's not, a, it's not in 100%, all of these things are 200%, but it is, it, is, it is an almost inevitable groove into which you'll fall unless you don't fall, if you know what I mean. Uh, so the great, the great drivers are these things in which there is this completely different dimension. Now, very, very quickly, so everything is now at stake. The state is not a point of social cohesion. Is the state an imposition on me, which has no legitimacy at all, in fact is the representation of no legitimacy, or is it that thing which will make Ireland work? You've got your own country, we've got ours. It is, this is democratic. Okay? And we have 65% of the vote, so to be honest with you, we win the elections. Now, what actually happened, and this is, I realise I have to um, move on, but I, I, this is important because I... I want to talk about some of how we face the past now when we get and I'll move on to that. Is this is this uh, relationship is all based on if necessary we will defend this by all means necessary. If necessary, we will have to use violence to get out. This is already extremely live in the 1920s. I mean, this is post-war. This is not very far away. So you, we are th those those slogans are are in the air. That's what's created unionism and nationalism. It's being disputed in Ireland as we speak. And essentially the movement is the IRA have, have claimed this right which is violence is necessary. And these people have claimed the right which is we will defend ourselves with all means necessary. So now what does that look like? In the north, what, and this is important too, what the unionists do is become essentially international pioneers. They, for democracies. They actually provide globally the blueprint of what democracies do when, they're, when they feel under threat. What they do is go through a logic pattern, which is they say, look, uh, we are under threat. Number two, normal law will not protect us. The nature of this threat is such that we can't just treat it as ordinary crime. We actually have to do, put in additional measures to control this because no, a normal law will not protect us. So we need additional powers. And number three, anybody who doesn't get this is either on their side or naive. Is either a traitor or naive. Th does that make sense? Now that's the logic tree. And in Northern Ireland that looks like the Special Powers Act. And the B specials and the specials and all of that kind of stuff. Now, that logic tree is now called Homeland Security. It is, we are under an existential threat. Normal law will not protect us. We need additional measures. <laughs> and anybody who doesn't understand that is either naive or a traitor, <laughs> frankly. And that is exactly the logic of how, all Western how Western democracy now defends itself on the global scale. So unionists essentially are not worse than anybody else. They're just adopting the way that people react when, they're under, when they feel they're under threat. And the difference is that because it's law, it's not simply violence, it is law. <laughs> Do you understand? In other words, it has the force of some moral authority. You should obey this. And the problem is not with our law, it's with the people who disobey it. Now, under the force of this law now, Everything now is turned from violence into force. <laughs> Magically, abracadabra. It's not violence, it's force. It's what the state has to do to defend its citizens. And while we can be critical of that, we have to understand that it's definitely what it looks like. And in fact, it's better than us having a free-for-all because the alternative would be a free-for-all. So actually, this is us getting it into, into a grip. And what you do is you send your B-specials then in to get the bad guys. Funny enough, the bad guys are over here. And the bad guys don't see it quite that way. <laughs> Number one, they see this as an invasion. Number, probably predictable, entirely predictable invasion, as you knew. But two, you certainly don't see the disguise of law as giving it any moral authority. In fact, it almost takes it away further. It means that you are trying to hide your violence behind some uh, delusory framework of law. Does that make sense? So now on this side, you're a terrorist. No, I'm not. I'm a freedom fighter. The only way I can get freedom here is to 
uh, fight my way out of this, them or us. On this side, of course, that doesn't look like that at all. <laughs> that looks like the evidence, if you ever needed it, that those people are, in fact, um, what you knew all along, terrorists, out to destroy you. They're not stabbing us in the back, they're stabbing us in the front. Uh, this is <laughs> evidence. So we must redouble our effort. We need more security. And it isn't, this is the thing about ethics. This is ethical. This is heroic. This is what you have to do. This is what good people do. Defend the community that's under attack from the terrorists. What? This is a democracy? You think that it's okay for them to come and grab us and stick them in prison and shoot people down the street and whatever they did in the curfews in the 1920s and all these people getting shot? You think that's all right? The only heroic thing I can do, especially if I'm a 16-year-old boy who has to defend my mother whose house is under attack or whose brother's or father's been taken out of the house, is respond. <laughs> and, the only, and if I don't, I'm actually a coward. So the only ethical response for me is to defend my, my community. <laughs> this is heroism. This is the courage of the soldier through the generations. Go, blah, blah. Now, does this, does this make sense to you? Our particular loop is to be stuck in this loop in which two things are, the, the particular ambivalence of Northern Ireland is this, is that our groups are so equally poised that, that no, first of all, two things happen. One, our, uh, our narrative sits side by side without anybody finally being able to impose their narrative on anybody else. And every act attempting to impose it is just understood within the framework. So if I try to show you I am right, you just think that's another balloon in turn of the screw and the other way around. <laughs> so every attempt through force to do this, i.e. with the authority of the state, is certainly going to be mistrusted over here. Every time the state says, this is the narrative, our narrative is the narrative, <laughs> the people here will go, not in your life. It's almost certainly the fascist state telling us what to think. On the other hand, here they're going, that is the truth, and I hope they're going to listen to it now, because that's, that's what needs to be taught in this community. <laughs> so the first thing is they sit side by side, and the second one is because they are so equal, the level of lethal force that they each use, while not equal, is more equal than it would be if it was a situation of 10 versus 90 or a very small armed group versus another. So therefore the stories on, there are stories on each side which are quite substantial. <laughs> and so when you come to the end of it at apartheid, you can definitely say, yeah we tell the whole story but 90% of these stories are one side rather than the other. <laughs> when you come to the end of this one, it's more complicated little, it's a more complicated arrangement. Because the question therefore is not, what is the truth? The question is, who is the judge? <laughs> who is the judge? And uh, that is what creates for, e for educationalists the really big question. By what authority do you speak? Do I tell the story from here? Or do I tell the story from here? Or do I tell the story from here? But we have to understand that if, you're, if your lived experience is in the middle of this, particularly if you are on the cutting edge of this, either geographically or community-wise or personally, then this is not something about which you're indifferent. You are telling me that my brother died as just collateral damage. I regret it, but I don't apologise for it which is the language of truth-telling in Northern Ireland now almost universally. I wish I hadn't had to do it, but I did have to do it. <laughs> do you understand? That is the language of our, of our dialogue with each other. We've got to the point where we say, well, it's an awful pity we had to do it, but we did. <laughs> which leaves the victims with a complete double message, which is, it is sad it happened, but you know something only so sad. And that's not, I'm not trying to be overly flippant about that. I'm actually trying to say that is what comes across now is you mean it and you don't mean it. And actually that not meaning it makes me feel worse. I wish you hadn't even gone to the regret point because the regret point and then saying you still had to do it makes it feel even more disposable. <laughs>